Ezra Black was homeless in a car, in a McDonald's parking lot, stealing Wi-Fi, learning how to code, and now here he is, full-time developer, making well into the six figures. He reached out to me about two years ago and told me the beginning of his story, you know, before he got that job. And I told him, no, no, we'll, we'll have you on the channel, you know, we'll let your story finish. Well, here we are about two years later. Welcome to the channel, Ezra, happy to have you. I wanna throw it to you right away, because again, what stuck out to me about your story was in a car, in McDonald's, stealing Wi-Fi, watching YouTube videos, learning how to code. So just how'd you get there? And yeah, just start talking about that. Yeah, I ended up getting into the position uh, due to Scott Trade. I was working for the Scott Trade investment firm. Uh, I was doing uh, security work for them through Allied Universal uh, and working in their technology fields, just, you know, being the guard there. And that got me really interested in the technologies and getting to be around, you know, the kind of environments that technology brings. And then Scott Trade closed in 2017. And whenever they closed, I didn't have a backup. So I found myself, you know, dealing with a strenuous situation of money and income, I was working like small contract jobs, doing things like that, and messing around with coding, like I was building like little video games on Unity and stuff like that, which I really enjoyed, but it wasn't really um, aggressively in my mind to be something that I really wanted to focus on. Uh, once the mother of my child, though, separated from me, um, I didn't have nowhere else to go, and I started living in my car. That's whenever it really started to accelerate. Uh, I started doing, um, you know, little teeny courses and things like that, and uh, I built a xylophone app for my daughter when I was younger. So that's kind of what hit it off was this uh, xylophone app that I wanted to build for my daughter so she wouldn't use my phone no more. And uh, we find ourselves here now. So was it always iOS or were you, I guess, yeah, how did you end up in iOS and not Android or web? Good question. So honestly, I kind of did a little bit of research. I wanted to do mobile development because it was the only device I had. So I didn't have nothing else with me to actually code with, but I looked at how much they make. <laughs> so I'm, I'm completely, you know, checked the field. I checked Glassdoor, I checked all that other stuff. I just wanted to be able to make enough to really support my family and be able to support myself as well. So iOS just ended up being the smarter choice. So talk about like, uh, just flat out, what is it like coding out of a car, stealing McDonald's Wi-Fi? Like how, how reliable was it? Like, was it constantly, were you watching YouTube videos and it would buffer all the time? Yeah, definitely. So I started with Angela U courses, um, eventually led into your courses, just searching for things through, you know, needs that I had for hers. And that actually led into needing better Wi-Fi. So I was doing the McDonald's needs. They were letting me use it uh, three or four hours out of the day. And then I'd kind of sit in my car and get close to the building, you know, uh, so they didn't like that too much. I ended up making. Some so they knew enemies. you were using it, though. They weren't. You weren't like you know. Oh, being yeah. sly about it. They they knew what was going on. Except at nighttime. <laughs> so eventually, though, they did start cutting their Wi-Fi on me because I had like two or three people out there that started figuring it out. So there was like a lot of people huddling around the building and using the Wi-Fi and everything. I had a friend though that went to the uh, a community college right across the street, and I eventually convinced him. Like I was like, hey, you know, like I really want to get into this coding. I'm I'm trying real hard. I showed him some of the example tutorial apps I was building, and he was down for letting me use his login credentials at the community college. So. I was able to use that Wi-Fi for the last stint before I finally signed up for the coding school that I went to. Back to the YouTube a little bit. You said Angela U courses, my courses. I, the reason I want to go to this is not to brag about my courses, but I, <laughs> I like to tell people that like YouTube is so powerful, right? I call it YouTube University. Oh, yeah. You know, a lot of people think you need the computer science degree and all that stuff. It's like, man, everything is is for free on YouTube or even the courses are relatively yep. cheap when you compare it to, you know, going to school for it. So I guess maybe dive into more about what videos you were watching as far as like tutorials or even like motivational videos to inspire you. Like what, what were you watching? You had um, a video before your courses. I speak about those. Uh, you had a video talking about how to be how you became an iOS engineer in seven months. And that really opened my eyes. And I can remember I was actually sitting in a McDonald's with like four old people next to me. And um, they were talking about, they were talking about funny things. And uh, the guy next to me, I can remember he even told me, he goes, that guy's telling you a whole bunch of malarkey. That's what he said. And he was like, you need to go out and get a job, you know, and everything else like that and get off your laptop. And I was just laughing because I was like, Maybe Oh, he was saying right. about me on the, on the video? Yeah. <laughs> he was like, oh, you're just listening to, That's you know, funny. some older man. And, yeah, but um, definitely just general motivational videos and stuff like that. But within Coding World, it was definitely uh, you, of course, and Paul. So Paul was a really big inspiration as well and a really big help. Just having the information out there was what really hit it off for me, realizing that all these different people that were already really far into the field or, you know, really established were providing these kind of resources and really making it seem like it was a transparent path 
was what really led me on to feeling like I could like, hey, I could do this, you know. How did you handle like meeting other developers, right? Because obviously it's probably not too many of them sitting in a McDonald's parking lot. Like how did you go about, you know, because right, you probably get stuck watching these tutorials or courses and you need to reach out yeah. for help. So how did you go about that? Uh, so it started with Twitter. Uh, Angela talks about, you know, doing the courses and everything. And as well as you talking about how you do social medias. I had a Twitter before already for years. So I was like, well, maybe I should just really get into this. So I focused a lot on building my Twitter and uh, following different iOS engineers. I kind of just stalked everybody's followers, you know, and went through and found every iOS engineer I could find, you know, shoving random questions down people's throats that they probably don't want to hear. A lot of it definitely was just getting into um, the internet side of things because I got lucky. Um, well, I guess I shouldn't say lucky. Let's not call this lucky, but COVID happened. So I was homeless and whenever COVID occurred, everything went online. And because everything went online, I was able to get a lot more of a quality of interaction with the community, which is what really hyper accelerated and like propelled it forward. You said those key words I was gonna ask you about. You said propelled it forward. I was gonna ask like, how did you, you know, you're, you're sitting in the McDonald's parking lot and then like you said, you eventually got to do the community college Wi-Fi. What was kind of like the, the big break or, or at least the start of the big break that started yeah, to propel yeah. you forward? I think my first big break was getting into Lambda because I started the Lambda uh, boot camp. And they have like a six month, nine month course and getting accepted into that. Real quick, you said that it was a big break. Was there a stringent application process? Like, like how did, yeah, why was it yeah. a, a big break just to get in? Well, I've never really accomplished too much in my life academically at the time. And um, they did have like a huge like beginner course that you had to do. At the time, I thought it was a lot bigger than what it was. But it was the first thing that I ever did and like had a reflection on like, hey, this is something that you're valid with. This is something that you can do. And getting done with that crash course in the beginning, they had like 60 iOS questions, you know, and like a basic app thing you had to do. Accomplishing that and being told like, hey, you know, we're going to accept you and knowing that I was sleeping in my car um, and then seeing all the other people that were there, you know, hey, I'm in my car and these people, you know, have beautiful desks already and setups and, you know, all the gear and everything. And I'm, I'm on equal level with them. So that was really like, a, I can do these things even in a more stringent environment. And because of that, it made me feel like I was like, hey, you know, this is something I can really do. This is something that I'm good at. You know, it was the, the validation outside of myself. So you, you're into Lambda. Talk about the, the bootcamp process. So that's what's really interesting as well is that once Lambda started, that's whenever COVID started getting really big. I started interacting with different people in the community and I ended up meeting a girl named Zoe through the internet. That I ended up starting dating, um, I think it was beginning of 2020. That was whenever like the bootcamp was starting to ramp up and everything. So I had a little bit more comfortability once it actually started to ramp up. But the experience in Lambda in general and like the coding experience um, was pretty solid. I'm not going to lie. Like after I got out and got to experience like the real environment, they did a pretty okay job at like getting you the blanket understanding of things and having a good syllabus. But the school was just not accommodating for how I learn. And the fact that I was just getting out of a situation that I got out of um, and dealing with, you know, rehabilitating myself into normality. And then on top of it, COVID happening. Moving, you know, I moved from St. Louis area to Springfield to be around Zoe um, and starting Lambda Hardcore in general made it just, um, it was something I couldn't accommodate myself to no more. So I kind of uh, just took what I knew and then what was left in the syllabus and kind of went wild on the internet. I dropped out of the school, did the hacking with Swift, you know, and just grinded out that last little bit and um, started doing interviews. So it sounds like that wasn't a setback because I would have thought, you know, quitting or leaving yep. the boot camp would have, you know, set you back because we just talked about how that was such a like big accomplishment getting in. But it sounds like you just kind of kept it moving, didn't, didn't not knock yeah. you back too far. And what I realized was that I wasn't there to get the piece of paper. I was there to learn. Once I knew, I felt like I was comfortable and strong in my understanding of what I can and can't do with coding and how you teach yourself. I, I just hit the races, you know. Uh, I was able to take the syllabus and realize like, I was like, hey, I got like four more months left of this. If I drop out now, I can hyper accelerate myself through this whole situation that's going on with COVID and have a potential chance to, you know, just break out of this tutorial chaos, you know. After the boot camp, you started going on interviews. And I know one of the questions I get asked all the time, because, you know, most of my audience is trying to get that first job is, is how do you even get these interviews? So talk through oh. like how you got these interviews and, and how that led to maybe even more interviews. Yeah, so I kind of wanted to stand out. That's an interesting question. I started getting really interested in my own fields and everything, which was automation and augmented reality. So I kind of fiddled with both of those to stand out since I didn't have a degree or nothing. What I started doing was I would do man in the middle proxy attacks on their application. And then I would go through all their JSON, you know, everything that gets, everything that goes out publicly on the phone. And I would structure everything and tell them what tools they're using and everything else like that. 
And instead of just having, you know, like my resume, I would give them a cover letter, which was a diagnosis of their application or, you know, like any things I might have found or like the technologies that they use and why they interest me, you know, just the journey of exploring their application and telling them I enjoy, you know, the technologies and what they're using. Um, that usually really was a standout thing. I, I got so many interviews that way, you know, I didn't get the jobs, but I definitely got the interviews just, you know, somebody being all like, who in the world is this guy? So it was definitely a good idea. Just tr just try to stand out a little bit, that's it. I kind of say that about my YouTube channel, my, my Twitter and, and the brand and everything like that. Like. I can get an interview pretty much everywhere. Whether I get the job or not, well, that's up to me, right? But all you can ask for is like the chance. Do whatever you can to stand out to get that chance. And then, you know, the interview is a whole nother story, <laughs> but at least you got the chance. <laughs> yeah, you know, I've seen people in interviews come in and, you know, they just have that amount of charisma that they can understand things. Or, you know, you go into jobs and you don't understand the frameworks that they are using. People can teach people how to code. You know, can we teach you how to take ownership? Can we teach you how to, you know, be responsible for what you work in, to be passionate? Those are things you can't teach people. Now, if we back up a little bit, this thought just occurred to me. You're homeless, living in a car, sitting at McDonald's. iOS development's not a cheap game to get into, right? You have to have a MacBook. You have to have an iPhone. Uh, how the hell did that happen? <laughs> Connect those dots for me. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. So what was wild is I had an old like 2010 MacBook that I got from a friend. And, you know, um, I used it for a little bit and it would not run Xcode for nothing. I can't imagine how frustrating that would be running Xcode on that old <laughs> machine. I'm <laughs> just thinking about it. Oh man, and it had the light up logo and everything. So, you know, I'm like sitting at McDonald's with it, just feeling cool. Like I thought the light up logo was still new and modern. <laughs> And I found this guy on Twitter named uh, Bill Polt, and he's like a multimillionaire and he's a philanthropist. He gives away money on Twitter to people in need. I, I posted on one of his things or tweeted on it, you know, and I said, uh, I need a, pair, a new pair of shoes and I need to get a MacBook for school. And like, I gave him like a screenshot of my application. The next day I woke up and I had $500 in my cash app. And I was able to take that money with my tax return. And then I took the old laptop to a pawn shop and I was able to get myself like a 2019 MacBook Air. Now you're off and running 2019 MacBook Air. Still not the greatest development machine, but better than what you had. You also talked about getting these interviews with standing out, but you also said you didn't get any of the jobs. So how did you actually get your very first job? Because what I led with at the very beginning of the show was this, you know, mid six figure job. That's where you're at currently, but there was a job before that. So how did you, how did you get that? Through Twitter again. Um, I was using Twitter to utilize like the networking and just, you know, being a part of the community. And I ended up finding the, uh, I think it was Cyril and another person that did a Twitter iOS hackathon. And um, I had a friend named Nadim and Nadim and I ended up joining up with uh, Alex Silver and Sam McGarry. And we did the iOS hackathon and uh, we had a application called AR Deck. It was really fun. We built it in 24 hours and Nadim is like the most amazing develop he's the he's the smartest developer i've ever met for his age truly so we built this application in 24 hours and somehow won and i was just as surprised as all of us were there was really great competition going on in there and all that networking and all the new followers i got led me to zach becker who um to this day you know i, I can't i couldn't give back to that man you know more than i could ever could uh, because Zach noticed me and told me, you know, he just started chatting with me and everything and asked me about my developer life and like what I've done. And I explained my life to him, my story. And um, he kind of, you know, told me that he was trying to pay it forward and felt like you, I could do the work really well. Uh, and he gave me um, a recommendation to apply for PK Global, which is one of the contractors for T-Mobile. So I went off with the races again. I applied and shockingly enough, they called me back and I got the job. So you mentioned that this was a contracting company for T-Mobile. So I guess when I hear contracting, I think building a bunch of random apps for a developer agency, but it sounds like you were working at T-Mobile, just not as a full-time employee, as a contractor. So how long did you do that? Because spoiler alert, you are a full-time employee at T-Mobile right now. How long did that take? And what was the process of getting hired full-time? In contracting, you do kind of get thrown on random teams and everything. And I was lucky enough to be thrown on the retail frontline experience. So I got to genuinely work with the, and I still work with the application that we have across 8,000 plus T-Mobile stores. Um, it's the front facing application that's used on the iPads um, across every single store, what the employees themselves use to actually sell your phone, purchase your phones, uh, trade your phones in, upgrade your phones. So I was able and lucky enough to be on a team that's important. <laughs> you know, like I know there's a lot of microservices and everything. And so I had a lot of opportunity to really take ownership of my work. Uh, we had, you know, I was doing automation work at first and we didn't have an automation team that was really big. Um, we didn't have anybody that was really leading automation at all. And, you know, I was, I guess this comes a little bit with naivety and also with just, you know, excitement. 
Uh, I don't know if, you know, I was five years into development um, in a company this big, I probably wouldn't have done this again. But I just jumped up at the idea of, well, hey, you know, I could, you know, we can do this and this and, you know, this is important to me and I want this to be done because, you know, without this getting done, this won't get done. And just taking ownership of things. Um, in about seven to eight months, I got a request and it was asked if I wanted to go full time. And I accepted. I didn't even think about it, actually. Or the repercussions <laughs> jumped of it. on it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I jumped on it so quick. And next I woke up a month later and I'm living in Seattle across the country and definitely has changed my whole life. That's for sure. I'm really thankful Man, for that's... you. I'm thankful for everything. Oh, I appreciate that. And that's. I mean, that's awesome. Here you are. That's where you are right now. That's, that's kind of the whole story getting you up to present. And I just want to recap, like, you know, you mentioned it earlier. Not only do you not have like a college degree, I think you said you don't even have a high school degree or, or a GED, right? And you're from nope. homeless in a McDonald's parking lot, stealing Wi-Fi. So now here you are full-time yeah. software developer, mid six figures. Like that's, that's an amazing story. And like I said, I'm so happy to share this. I can't wait to see like the comments and the reaction. Like, I think it's awesome. So not to discount like how far you've come in this awesome story, but I got to ask, like, what's next? What, what are the next two, three, four, five years have in store for Ezra? Like, what, where do you want to go? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think that I'm going to focus on stability and financial growth and in terms of my career and everything, augmented reality is right around the corner, you know, and that's where I like to focus. I enjoy fiddling with all of the bleeding edge technologies and a lot of my obsession right now is in LiDAR. So hopefully once we start getting like the hardware to catch up with the software, um, there'll be a whole new wave of something for me to enjoy and maybe ride that wave as well. So we'll see, but it's probably going to be something to do with augmented reality. I, I've kind of been watching from the sidelines a little bit. Like I said at the beginning, you reached out probably two years ago, you know, telling me where you're yep. at with your story and kind of been, you know, keeping, keeping tabs a little bit here and there. And it's just awesome to see kind of like it all come to fruition with, with where you are now, again, making well into the six figures. So I know you're excited to share your story, but I'm just as excited. Like I said, I can't wait for people to hear this. And I think it's going to be inspiring to so many people. You know, that's all I really hope for. I mean, if it wasn't for your videos and getting inspired myself, I wouldn't have had nothing, you know, and I, I feel like everything starts in your mind because it obviously does. And if you just have that a little bit of drive and focus and the want to have better and stop discounting your future, you're going to get places. Just focus. It's a great way to end it. Well, I appreciate you coming on, Ezra, and we'll see you all in the next video. Yep, definitely. Appreciate you.